I'm going to get started then. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is Friday, December 17th. Uh, it's um, 11 a.m. and I'll call this meeting to order. Um, so uh, we pre-filed our rules uh, one and two, the first two of five rules um, with ICAR. Um, and they were approved by ICAR. That's kind of a very initial first step in that process. Um, we filed them with the Secretary of State today and next Tuesday. We're going to be reviewing and voting on our remaining three rules. Um, and we hope that that means that we can pre file them before the new year. Um, and that again kind of puts us on a track towards um, meeting our statutory deadlines uh, that are in Act 164. Um, again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, please read these rules, give us feedback, or just don't read them and give us feedback. Uh, we just need <laughs> feedback. Um, every state um, that is legalized has made mistakes. They've left things out. Um, they've done things that they wish they didn't um, that don't make sense. And we really here in Vermont are trying to create a regulatory structure that allows the Vermont ethos to survive and thrive. And the only way that we can do that is to hear from the people that have built that ethos and are going to be most directly impacted by these regulations. So we're going to be meeting again next Tuesday. That'll be a slightly longer meeting um, when we kind of review and finalize rules three, four and five. Um, the board will again hold its after hours meeting um, from six to seven on December. 28th. And that'll be live streamed. You can join by a kind of a link on our website. Uh, we don't have a physical location quite yet, but it'll most likely be here at, in Montpelier, 89 Main Street. Um, and then that's really it for December. We're going to we have plans to convene our uh, advisory committee the first week of January to discuss our January 15th reporting requirements. And with that, I would uh, ask, have you guys had a chance to review the minutes from the 15th? Yes. Yes. All right. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And I will just move on to the rest of the agenda today. Again, we're going to be discussing rules three and four, um, kind of at a high level overview. Um, rule three is really around the medical program and the specifics there. Again, the medical program rules are set to expire in March, and we need to um, kind of uh, create additional rules um, or kind of refile rules around the medical program. Again, trying to align it with the adult recreational market and ensure that um, nothing, no rule that we enact is more um, restrictive than the current uh, Department of Public Safety rules that are in effect. Uh, rule four, four is really around um, enforcement of our regulations. You know, what do violations look like? How do we provide notice to um, licensees? What does the grievance process look like? And um, and then rule five is around board removal, um, board member removal. Um, so, Brynn, if you're ready, I'll turn things over to you. Yep. Um, OK, so thank you for that introduction. So the, what, you're, the, what the board is going to do today is to um, review some kind of remaining outstanding issues on rules three and four, the rules governing the medical program and the compliance and enforcement rule. And then um, after that, we'll move on to rule five, which you reviewed um, in some detail on Wednesday. Um, and there's one small change to rule five. Um, you have one remaining issue to discuss. And then the hope was that you could um, vote on that one if you're ready. So then next Tuesday, you just have to go through rules three and four, the actual text of rules three and four and, and vote on those on Tuesday. Okay. So rule three, the remaining issues that are um, kind of outstanding to discuss are um, one issue that Julie raised when we reviewed the when we reviewed um, kind of the bulk of that rule initially, which was in the portion governing the requirements for dispensary applications, whether or not there should be a requirement that the dispensary submit a plan for training or education of its staff. And um, the board had some conversation about whether 
making that requirement since it is not required in the DPS rule would be in conflict with um, that statutory provision 7 VSA 956, which provides that no rule may, may be more restrictive um, than the DPS rule. But um, I'm kicking that back to the board for your continued conversation on that point. Um, any conversation around that? I mean, I. I think I've already said how I feel about this. I really do think that the dispensary should have a requirement to submit a plan for training for their staff. Wow, uh, I would agree. I, I think it wouldn't even be a cause for conversation if it wasn't for that no more restrictive right. language, I think. At least from my perspective, I don't know how you feel. Um, and just so you all know, I did do a statutory review and uh, also checked, uh, talked a little bit with uh, the current medical program staff, but do you think that it's defensible to add that type of language on the basis of requirements that are currently in statute and that operate in conjunction, obviously, with the current rules? All right, yeah, let's definitely do it then. And we'll just, you know, again, like the what, what's going to happen is if we include it in our rules, um, LCAR is really the avenue where um, they're going to look at the rule. They're going to go to the lead sponsors and all the committees that created those this specific requ statutory requirement, and they're going to ask if this is within the legislative intent. And so it's really going to be their ultimate decision, but mm -hmm. I think we should include it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So the next issue for your discussion um, is so when we're again we're talking about rule three talking about the requirements for patients um should that healthcare professional verification form uh, be required with each annual renewal or would you like to make that a uh, semi-annual renewal so it happens every other year so that's the form that's required where um, the healthcare professional signs off that the person has a qualifying condition and are we treating chronic pain differently than the other qualifying conditions with respect to this with respect to just renewals generally no we're not waiving the annual renewal for so incurable diseases there is um that's a statutory requirement okay. and um we do have right. we've had some conversations about whether that should be a requirement in statute or not okay. but it's not moved. I'm fine with every two years. I am too. Me too. Okay. Moving right along. Well, I'm sure. I think more owners are going to get for the best renewals, the, the less Agreed. strong the medical program will be moving forward because people will just say it isn't worth it. Yeah. You know. Okay. So the last uh, remaining issue for the medical program rule is um, has to do with the background checks for caregivers. Um, and the proposal is if there's a caregiver, um, if a caregiver is a family member, should the board um, grant a temporary registration for that caregiver pending the outcome of the background check? Um, so this has come up uh, in situations where a person has um, been diagnosed with a terminal illness, they need access to medications immediately. Um, should a family member caregiver be given a temporary registration? while the board conducts the background check. Seems like a pretty easy one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and right. we asked in our last meeting if there'd ever been an issue with a right. caregiver, right? Right. Yeah. I yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Yes. I should allow this temporary registration. Okay. So that completes the outstanding issues on rule three so the board will review the full text of that rule on tuesday okay so we're gonna move on to rule four and um we talked um i can't remember what day that was maybe last friday about the about rule four the compliance and enforcement rule um and i showed we went through some slides um, primarily on the categories of violations and what the potential outcomes could be. So just a few more slides um, to review the process 
set out in rule four. Um, I'm just starting with this last um, this last slide that you review that kind of sets out the notice, how the notice process works. Um, notice of violations can be issued with or without an immediate effect, depending on whether or not um, the violation poses an immediate threat to public health or safety. Um, so we're going to go through what that process looks like um, for starting out with yep, the notice of violations. So um, notice of violations, the contents are, are listed here on the left and service on the right. So a notice will contain a concise statement of the nature of the violation and any factual basis for it. Um, the penalty or penalties to be imposed, any associated health and safety orders um, if the violation poses a threat to public health or safety, um, and information to the licensee about how to contest the violation um, and how to pay a waiver penalty if the licensee wishes to do so, and also submit a corrective action plan if that's part of the violation. And we'll talk about the waiver a little bit more on the next slide. Um, and then service, uh, sufficient service shall be certified mail to the business address um, on the licensee's application and also by email. And then there's also a provision that the licensee can opt in to receiving notice only by email. Okay. So um, moving through the process here, a licensee can waive their right to contest a violation um, and pay a waiver penalty instead. So the amount that's provided for on the notice shall be the wa uh, waiver penalty amount. And if the licensee chooses to do that, they can pay the waiver penalty and that will constitute kind of an acceptance of the board's penalty. Or uh, the licensee can choose to deny the violation um, and contest, contest it in writing or request a hearing, depending on what type of penalty they face. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and depending on the outcome, the fine assessed, the waiver penalty can be the same as what the fine assessed ultimately is or the ultimate um, fine could be lower based on the board's final decision. Okay, so we'll go through the process. Um, if the violation poses no immediate threat to public health or safety, so this kind of sets out the timelines um, that the board has to abide by. So within 15 days of receiving a notice of violation, the licensee can contest. Um, by filing a written response to the board. And that written response has to contain each issue in fact and dispute, um, the rationale behind the licensee's position and any pertinent facts to be determined by the board. If the licensee fails to contest the violation within 15 days, that constitutes an admission and an acceptance of the penalty. Um, if the licensee does respond, the board has to consider that response and issue a final decision in writing within 15 days of receiving the licensee's response. And if the violation um, penalty, if the associated penalty is a suspension or a revocation, then the licensee can request a hearing before the board. And the hearing has to take place within 20 days of the board receiving that request unless the licensee waives that 20 day timeline. Um, evidence can be introduced at that hearing in accordance with the statutory rules of evidence for contested administrative cases. There's a statute um, that will be cited in the rule. And the board can issue a, a final decision either on the record at the hearing or in writing within 15 days after the hearing is complete. And the board, their fi the final decision of the board either um, after the hearing or just uh, in writing um, in response to the licensee's response can be to either uphold its original violation notice or to revise the penalty to be less severe um, or it can dismiss the notice altogether or the violation altogether. And then um, a person who wants to appeal that final decision can do so in accordance with statute. And that 7 VSA 847 is the same uh, appeal process that you reviewed on Wednesday with respect to the board um, removal rule. So we can look at that again if you'd like. This is the um, provision that 
a person has to appeal within 30 days of the decision to the executive director who assigns the case to an appellate officer. And an appeal from there goes to the Supreme Court. So just a reminder that this tracks almost identically with the process that the Agency of Agriculture uses for violations of the people that they license. Um, there's a few, you know, statutory changes in our in our in our statutes um, around time frames, but they do 15 and they do 30 days. Um, but uh, other than that, it's almost identical, which I think is a benefit to the people that are used to that sort of um, process that have been living with it um, already. It won't it won't seem new or out of place for most of the kind of people we hope will be participating. Yeah, and if our if our hearing shall take place within 20 days versus 30 days at ag, recognizing that this is folks livelihood yeah. and if there's an, an issue and they need to stop or close their doors or whatever, I think. It makes sense that we work as expeditiously as we can to come to some type of resolution. That's good. Thank you. Okay, there's one more, and this is just if the violation does pose an immediate threat to public health or safety. So the timelines, this is very much the same, but the timelines are a little different. <clears throat> so um, if the violation does pose a threat to public health or safety, the notice of violation that the board um, submits to the licensee has to plainly state that the penalty will take effect immediately. And then the board has to confirm the violation notice and the penalty within seven days of the licensee. So for these types of violations, um, suspensions, revocations, or health and safety orders take effect immediately. Um, if they're accompanied by a written finding that they're, the violation posed an immediate threat to public health, safety, or welfare. However, any associated fines or corrective action plan requirements will not take effect until the conclusion of the process. Um, so then again, we move into the same kind of process here. 15 days of receipt, uh, the licensee has 15 days to contest by filing a response to the board in writing. And that response has to include the same information that, um, that was provided on the former slide about facts um, supporting their position. Um, failure to contest within 15 days, again, constitutes an admission of the violation and an acceptance of the penalty. And then the board has 10 days to respond to the licensee's response with a final decision. Um, and if the, if the penalty associated with the violation is a revocation or a suspension, um, once again, licensee can request a hearing um, as opposed to just a written response. And that hearing has to be within 10 days of the board receiving the request for the hearing um, that's opposed to 20 days for the for. Yep, as opposed to 20 days. Um, again, evidence has to be in accordance with the statutory rules of evidence for contested cases under the uh, Administrative Procedure Act. And then the board um, can either issue its final decision on the record at the hearing or in writing within 10 days after the hearing is complete. So 10 days as opposed to 15 days if the violation doesn't pose um, a threat to public health or safety. And again, same thing, the board's final decision either um, after the hearing or just in response to the licensee's response to the violation notice can either revise the penalty to be less severe or it can be the same um, penalty as imposed in the original notice of violation or the board can dismiss the violation altogether. And the appeal process is the same. That's it for rule four. Just, uh, I have just one question about the, um, the hearing shall be within 10 days unless weighed by the licensee. What's the effect of it not happening in 10 days um, if not waived, do we is a default against the state. You don't provide for that. That's right. The rule does not provide for that. I mean, yeah, that you you could add something if you wanted. Well, I I just you know I'm trying to think of just the worst case scenario. These are the worst case scenarios, right? And you know I think about just like I don't like to really go down that path 
um, necessarily, but like, you know, there was a quarantine of all vape products during the Evoli scare in Massachusetts. And so that was in order. I think it's not, it didn't come from the Cannabis Commission. I think it came from the governor. Um, but I wonder if we did something like that to all retailers in the state, um, you know, having to do all of them within 10 days might be difficult. So, you know, I just wonder if there's some like for good cause extension or something along those lines that might allow the board to extend um, to a reasonable amount of time for cause, for a good cause. We can add something like that. Does that take us out of line with the APA or anything else? I mean, is not really. This is only, this is our own process. The APA only fully, fully applies once you get down to the okay. appeal in accordance with the statute. Yeah. Um, so I think we'd have flexibility to add some language about the consequence if the board doesn't meet those deadlines okay. or, you know, where, where, how much flexibility there might be. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, do we, do we care? I mean, I'm trying to, like, I don't, I hate to be like the doom and gloom kind of like worst case scenario, but I think it's prudent to, to <clears throat> at least acknowledge that that is a set of facts that could play out at some point in the future, whether we want it to or not. Yeah. Better to explore it now. And I think, yes, there should be some sort of second option or, or pause if, if there's something major like that. Yeah. Okay. And just think, um, thinking about the appeals process and, and um, 3 VSA 840, or sorry, 7 VSA 847, I do think the consequence of the board not meeting that 10 day deadline could be that the appellate, not the appellate, the, um, the administrative judge could throw out the board's yeah. penalty because we didn't follow our own yeah. process. Yeah, I mean, and it's unique. That's not necessarily that, that scenario isn't really hinting at a, a bad actor in respect to a license holder, but more so product issues industry wide. Right. Um, God forbid, but. Um, well, when I read that initially, I just thought that there might be some good cause that the board might show that the, you know, licensee might not agree to, might, you know, to waive that deadline. Um, but there's a good cause. There's a good reason for it. As yeah. long as we're moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. It could also provide for consolidated hearings. Yeah. It's the same issue as affecting multiple yeah. licensees. Yeah. They don't all have to be, they don't have to be separate hearings necessarily yeah. if it's one yeah. issue. Right. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Is that is it all right if we leave it there? Or do you need more yep. discussion? No, that's good. Okay. That's fine. That's the only thing I notice. Uh, I think everything else looks great. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. So that um, completes your discussion on rule four. If you don't have anything else, so we'll move to rule five and mm -hmm. take a final look. <clears throat> so. Um, this is the rule that you walked through on Wednesday. Um, I wanted to flag that in response to the boards, um, one of the issues that Julie raised, there has been one amendment to the language of Rule 5, and that is here under the initial inquiry section in subsection B. So this, um, the change provides that the legal counsel, um, once he or she has been directed to institute um, an inquiry. Um, they have to provide notice to the chair and the participating member of their initial written findings. So this is the, um, the issue about notifying. Um, oops, no, this is the participating member. So this. You mean I'm, the subject? The member. subject, right. Oops. So that should just say. I made the same problem, same mistake on Wednesday. <laughs> do we want to put it in? I'm sorry if, if I'm just not seeing this language. Do we want to add any language there that unless it, you know, unless it gives an opportunity for the subject member to become too close to the investigation or yes, something along those lines? Wait a second. This is the same, I think. 
Yeah, for some reason the sections aren't showing up in what you have up there, which is confusing. Let me look at the draft I have here. No, no, is it? No, that's not there either. Okay, we may just have a different um, version that we're looking at, so just hold on for a moment. I'm gonna do this, and then I can look at them. I think you had you had mentioned that like they should receive notice if there's a complaint being investigated against them unless the nature of the complaint and the nature of the subject member lends itself to that subject member but put itself or his or herself in a situation where they're actively doing something nefarious with relation to that violation. Yeah, it's probably I mean, it, later in one. terms of like doom and gloom. Like the way I have seen that play out and this play out is that it gives an opportunity for whoever's investigating we'll or other two people answers, yes right. to like build a case that is unfair sure. that's that's right. it is, yeah. and, it has okay. the, and it has the right yeah and the irony of drafting this role is we hope to never have to use it <laughs> um right. our future boards will never well, have to I use it like actually read it and that's right. unique in with respect to what we're doing except for parts of okay. rule four i hope we never have to do <laughs> Some of those scenarios or what you want to call it, but. Okay. Got the right version now. So the new language is here in 532 sub B. So this notifies the subject member of their complaint unless notification would compromise okay. the initial inquiry by the um, legal counsel. Thank you. So that's the only change to the text of it as we went through it on Wednesday. Um, there, the board did have some conversation about whether or not the process should be confidential. Um, so yeah, I raised the issue that you know maybe these proceedings should be confidential. I I had wrongfully assumed that they were confidential in other contexts. Uh, David kind of pointed me to the. Um, Judicial Ethics Bureau board, um, and this pretty well tracks what you know is happens in other kind of disciplinary actions. So um, I'm fine with it. Not the formal proceedings not being confidential. Same. Great. Yep. yep. Subject to, of course, like public records laws or whatever. Right. And there's the carve out for the personnel yeah. files. So that's already in there. Right. So are you ready to vote out rule five then? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I would take a motion to approve rule five as drafted as we see here. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I don't know if we have anything else on our agenda for today um, other than public comment. I know that uh, next Tuesday we are planning on having a, a probably more of a marathon meeting just to review the actual text um, line by line of uh, four, rules three and four. Um, so uh, why don't we just move towards public comment for today? We're a little ahead of schedule, but if you we have some folks in the room. We'll start with them. Do you have a public comment? Nope. Um, anyone who joined via the link, um, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment. First up, we have Jesse Lynn. Hello, how are y'all doing today? Thanks so much for having us all and taking public comment. Um, I just wanted to reiterate my request for you guys to address reciprocity. Uh, why can't I say it? Um, reciprocity <laughs> today. Um, so if you guys could, you know, I mentioned before, I think reciprocity is really important for patients who are moving to Vermont from out of state, who are coming visiting on vacation, who have second homes. So if you guys could please consider looking at readdressing reciprocity, I think that's an important part of the program we're missing. Also wanted to mention having that second sign off for the PTSD verification. We haven't had much discussion or chat around that. I would love to see if that's something you guys could recommend to remove that second needed signature because that is definitely a barrier and roadblock for patients to get their card. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to thank you and agree that I, I strongly believe we need educated medical staff or medical 
professionals or at least the medical dispensary staff having a stronger education and background. And in my opinion, I um, really, like I said, I appreciate you guys pushing for that. And if the dispensaries or legislators are trying to work against that, that's a larger concern from the systemic kind of sense. So, so again, just hoping you guys can look at the PTSD and the reciprocity as we move forward and include that while you're making some of this rulemaking change. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Next is Tita Byrne. Um, hi, guys. Uh, just a quick thought um, about um, the, the current rule for caregivers. Um, going forward, I think we really need to see some clarity on a, a caregiver who is also a patient. You know, so uh, the way the rule reads right now, it says they can have uh, two mature, seven immature, and two ounces in between them. And that the way it's written right now, that indicates to me in a vehicle, because clearly in your home, you're allowed to have as much cannabis as you want. So it's just, it's unclear there. And um, I think obviously a, a, a caregiver who's a patient obviously has to grow their two plants for themselves. And obviously they have to grow their two plants for their the person they're caregiving for. So it would just be nice to see protections in there for caregivers um, so that they can grow their plants and the plants for their caregivers or for their patients rather uh, in the same place. Thank you. Thank you, Tito. Anyone else who joined by the link? Do we have anyone that joined by phone? One person on the phone. So if you join by phone and you'd like to comment, um, please just hit star six to unmute yourself. Oh, uh, Jesse Lynn raised her hand again. Um, Jesse Lynn, we try not to do repeat uh, comments um, during these meetings. Uh, we will be meeting again next Tuesday uh, and have probably at least two public comment periods then. Um, and I know you know how to reach us all. So if you would like to comment, please um, just either submit it through the web portal or email us or um, come back to us on Tuesday. Uh, we had Old Growth Organics just raised their hand. Growth. Hey, I figured since this is such a quick meeting, now might be the time to do this, but there's actually a shout out to Amelia. I just want to ask if you want to be my friend. Um, I always really respect what you have to say, but I don't know how to get a hold of you, and I'm moving to Vermont soon. So Old Growth Organics on Instagram is spelled out just like in the participant here with underscore between um, the words. Thank you guys so much for your time and for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Well, um, just a reminder, we do have um, our another meeting on Tuesday at 11, and um, we'll be reviewing rules three and four in, in greater detail then. So other than that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Good.